can get started. We will call the meeting to order. And Claire, may we have a roll call, please? And that's everyone? Okay. Okay, we can stand to salute the flag. <clears throat> Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> okay, the notice requirements of the open public meeting law for this meeting have been satisfied. A copy of the notice having been sent to the Asbury Park Press in the coaster and filed in the office of the township clerk on July 21st, 2023. There is an emergency exit through the courtroom doors and two exits at the rear of the room. There will be no smoking, no new cases will be started after 10 o'clock p.m., and no new testimony taken after 10.30 p.m. In addition, the applicant will be limited to 45 minutes of testimony. All meetings will be video and audio taped and shown on the Township of Ocean's Community Cable Channel, Channel 22 on Verizon Fios, and Channel 77 on Cable Vision. All cell phones must be turned off, or if you need to make a call, please make your call outside of the room. And uh, before we get to the resolution memorializations, um, I do want to announce that Mr. Uh, Richard Van Wagner has resigned from his position, which leaves a vacancy for the vice chair uh, position. And at this time, I would like to nominate Mr. John Fuller. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. And Claire, if you can please call the roll. Mr. Fuller? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. 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 Okay, congratulations, Mr. Thank Fuller. And we have resolution memorializations for Andrew and Keith Compton, Block 151, Lot 10, 10 Freehold Road, Ocean, Expansion of Non Conforming Use Variance Approval, Robert Davidson and Stephanie Russell, Block 22, Lot 61. 332 Overbrook Avenue, Oakhurst, bulk variance approval. Lauren and Todd Hundley, block 79, lot 3, 920 Bendermere Avenue, Ocean, bulk variance approval. Joseph and Ruth Salama, block 25.34, lot 15, 451 Brookside Avenue, Oakhurst, bulk variance approval. And Mr. Steinberg, the first one. Um, since it's not a bulk variance approval, does that one need to be done separately or they can all be done at the same? They can all be done. Okay. The, the vote for, for that uh, is, uh, requires five votes, the expansion of the non-conforming uh, use variance. But it received five votes for the memori memorialization purposes. It, okay. It, there's no set number for approval. And I think the municipal, municipal land use law says as little as one member who, who voted on the application can vote on the resolution. Okay. Okay, if someone will offer. I'll offer. And a second. I'll second. Okay, Claire. <coughs> yes. 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 I'll read cues. I was not here last month. Okay. The following cases will be carried to September 21st, 2023, to be held in the public meeting room municipal building deal in Monmouth Roads, Oakhurst, Ashkenazi, Block 11.01, Lot 3, 1036 Norwood Avenue in Ocean, 
So Aurora Land Development, Block 22, Lots 85 and 85.01, 280 Norwood Avenue, Ocean. Memo Investments, LLC, Block 7, Lot 51, 44 Monmouth Road, Oakhurst. Abatey, Block 63, Lot 7, 511 Monmouth Road, West Allenhurst. And we have our first continued case, Elon High School, Inc., Block 207, Lot 1 and 8, 1200 Roselt Avenue, Ocean, Zone R4. Applicant is withdrawing the request to permit a Judaic education summer day camp and seeks approval for an expansion of the building, number of students, and number of staff, also to modify slash eliminate conditions of approval granted in 2011, to increase student limit from 160 to 250, to increase number of buses allowed, to eliminate the 50-person occupancy limit for service at the synagogue, and to eliminate the restriction prohibiting overnight parking. The attorney for the applicant is Ms. Jennifer S. Krimko. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. Jennifer Krimko on behalf of the applicant. And while everything you stated and that was true, there were some additional things as part of the application that wasn't in its entirety. So just to keep the record clear for the public, there were other things as well. With that being said, I know, Madam Chair, that you were not here at the last meeting. Did you have the opportunity to review the tapes and sign the certification? I did, signed it, and emailed it. It should be on file. Okay, and it looks like Mr. Lineski was here at the last one. I just want to make sure on the event we conclude. Mr. Lineski, just please remind me, did you review I the tapes for the first one? Yes, I, I sent it all on. Perfect. So everybody here is eligible to vote? Everybody was here for I all believe of them. So. Okay, fantastic. So hopefully what we're going to do tonight is going to be relatively um, short as far as what the applicant is concerned. As you know, we've been through two or three hearings already, uh, <clears throat> and we've committed to quite a few changes on the plans. We got through our engineer, our architect, our traffic engineer, and that leaves the planner. Uh, so I would like to introduce Andrew Janu, have him sworn, and pass out some exhibits. There are two exhibits that we are going to share with you. <clears throat> One is a color rendered exhibit showing all of the changes to the site plan that we agreed to at the last meeting that Andy will go through from a planning perspective as we, as we proceed. So I think this would be A9, is that correct, Claire? Okay. Anyone, Mark, you have notes? And I'm sorry, can you, um, Mr. Janner? Jan Yu. Oh, Jan Yu. J A N I W. I, I think I left off on A8. A8 was the V. Okay, it's A9. A8 was the vehicle circulation plan. So, A9 is a color rendered landscape and tree preservation plan prepared by. Nelson Engineering, and it is dated 8-11-23. And this is just for reference as Andy goes through the testimony outlining all of the changes that we have made to date while he's giving the support and planning testimony. Okay, Mr. Uh, Janney, do you... Oh, uh, we're not, I'm not done yet. Oh, sorry. One more. Is the hand up? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Eight ten. To it further is a um, aerial photograph of the parking lot of the Ocean Township High School with the bus depot with 30 or 40 buses parked on site in immediate proximity to the neighboring residential. I know that there were some questions that the board asked with regard to a homeowner having to look at a bus, and we want to show you that that's a typical uh, situation as it relates to a school, and even expected. With that, I'd like to have Andy sworn, and we'll get into his testimony. Okay, Mr. Janu, can you raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth? I do. And um, have you testified before this board before? I have. Uh, for the record, my name is Andrew Janu. I'm a licensed professional planner, as well as a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners testified before this board on numerous occasions, been qualified throughout the state, currently serving as the planner for the borough of Carteret, Township of Livingston, um, and have been appointed to the State Board of Professional Planners. But clearly not that memorable, Madam Chair. <laughs> and, and, and just spell your last name because you're uh, new sir. to Claire. Uh, yes. Yep. Okay. Thank oh, you. you listen to me, Claire. That's so nice. Okay. Andy, knowing that you're the expert and you've, you've been here for all of the various hearings, 
and recognizing in the conditional use variance we need and any other relief we need, if you could walk the board through from a planning perspective, the justifications for the relief being sought. Certainly. Uh, we are seeking a D3 conditional use variance. So in a, a D3 conditional use variance, unlike a standard use variance, the uh, thrust of the testimony relies on the ability of the site to accommodate the deviation from the standard. Um, as you know, the, both the school and the synagogue are permitted uses within the R4 district. Um, there are standards that are conditions for those uses, and I'd like to go through those briefly. Uh, the conditional use standards uh, for a lot area are four acres required for the school, uh, which is for 250 students, two acres for the first 150 and one acre for each additional 50, whereas we are providing 3.64 acres. So we're 0.36 acres shy in terms of the lot area. Uh, two acres are required for the synagogue. The synagogue uh, meets the uh, requirement for and, lot area. And Andy, in Jim's letter, he had pointed out that if the two uses are operating together, it should be the combined area, but the testimony was that these two uses do not operate at the same That's time. So in your opinion, is it appropriate from a planning perspective to look at them as individual uses since they're operating at different times? That's correct, because they they will not cross-reference, if you will, the infrastructure. Okay. Uh, minimum front yard setback, and this applies to Roselle Avenue, 50 feet is required. 39.3 exists to the existing building that was uh, approved previously. We are not aggravating that. The addition that we are proposing will be set back at the requisite 50, 50 feet. 100-foot um, setback is required for a synagogue as a conditional use. We meet that requirement. Minimum lot depth, 200 feet required for schools and synagogues, whereas 100 feet exists. That's an existing condition. That's because of the shape of the lot. That's something we can't cure. It's just one of those, we'll talk about hardships, uh, one of the things we can't cure uh, and we uh, have has previously been reviewed and approved for this site. Uh, building height, 30 feet is permitted for a school and 35 feet for a synagogue. The existing uh, uh, school structure is 30 feet two and one quarter inches. The addition that's being proposed complies with the height requirement. So the height differential the variant that triggers the variance was something that was previously reviewed and approved. And finally, the buffer to residential ordinance requires a 25 foot buffer width. Eight is proposed to remain. That's an existing condition. And that eight feet is going to be extended in the southern parking lot where we're adding three parking spaces. Um, I'll discuss that a little bit later. But let me just interrupt you for a second. And again, as the board knows, we're proposing those three parking spaces, but we're open to green banking them if that was the board's desire and they instructed us accordingly. And Andy, without going through each of the bulk variance leaf, because we did it with Dave and we did it with the report, it essentially has to do with landscaped islands, parking space width, the number of curb cuts, which we're actually improving over what is the nonconformity. Correct. The parking spaces, which was discussed at length by our traffic engineer, the landscaping along property lines and the fence height, where we're proposing a six-foot fence uh, along uh, Roselle, where four feet is permitted, and that was in response to the neighbors. That's correct. Okay. So as it relates to the variances, uh, I'm sorry, as it relates to where we came in and we heard what the board members had to say and um, what their professionals had to say in the public, referencing what we moved in as A9 into evidence, what changes were made uh, to address those concerns. So A9 uh, specifically addresses the comments that we've heard from the board and from the residents, and I'll, I'll go through those briefly. Um, specifically, the western end of the landscaped island um, has been, there was some concern about bus turning radii. That has been softened and shortened for improved bus turning, uh, and you'll see that modification now uh, with the circle template, so that's uh, intended to improve on-site circulation, and we believe it accomplishes that. Um, sidewalks have now been shown along Roselle and Logan, along Roselle from the Egress Drive to the intersection with Logan, and along Logan from the curb cut to the corner with Roselle. Uh, the uh, request for additional sidewalks further down Roselle uh, really wasn't 
uh, considered because there are no there's no curbs or walk there to connect to. So we provided walks where uh, we had discussed. A crosswalk has been added across Logan uh, at the access uh, drive across the street to the uh, that would be the Interlaken inter inter uh, intersection, and that's depicted there on the right side of this property. Uh, the parking spaces to the southeast corner have been shaded. These are the uh, spaces that Jennifer uh, referenced in terms of we're seeking some guidance from the board. We offered to green bank those, we could build those, or we could eliminate those. Uh, that's really to the discretion of the board. And, Andy, and just so the board, and looking at the plan, what you can <clears throat> see in the dark gray is what is being filled in. The light gray is existing pavement, the dark gray is what's being filled in. Correct. And you see there are three trees there that would need to be removed in order to put those parking spaces in. You did hear the testimony that we don't need them based on the uh, actual counts of people in the school, but we were looking to add as much as we could. The neighbor didn't want them, so we would leave that to the board's discretion. Um, there was a request to uh, depict the fence from the end of the existing fence toward the driveway to Logan Road that has been depicted on this plan. And we continue a six foot uh, fence along the 14 spaces closest to Roselle. Uh, this continues around the bus parking area and up to the front setback line of Herbert Avenue. And that will be a six foot solid fence. Uh, we've moved the pole mounted light fixtures uh, along Roselle back 22 feet from the Roselle right of way. Um, and we've also depicted uh, that we will now be providing 10 to 12 foot evergreen plantings. We were asked to provide uh, taller plantings. We have done that uh, with a note that says we will uh, plant those uh, pursuant to uh, the direction of the board's planners. And that's uh, the sum of the changes that and have been made. As it relates, I had indicated at the beginning when Madam Chair was reading the application that some of the relief of conditions were listed, but let's take this opportunity to go through and specifically put on the record the prior conditions we're seeking to amend. Certainly. So in terms of the number of students at the site, the previous approval dating back to 2011 permitted 160. We're seeking to increase that to 250. Uh, we had a limitation on staff. Uh, we are now seeking to increase that from 40 to 55 with no more than 30 staff members on site at any time. Uh, we're increasing the number and type of buses on site from two to four coach style buses with two standard buses and one van uh, proposed. The uh, three of the coach buses will park on site in the southwesterly portion of the property. Uh, one of the coach buses will park during the day at the Simontov uh, bus de depot at 505 Memorial Avenue in Neptune, and the two standard buses in the van will return to their bus depots during the day. They are local bus providers. What was permitted before? Two. Two, two coach. Only two, two, two coach and an unlimited number of smaller vans. Right. Correct. Yeah, okay. Unspecified number, I should say. Yeah. But unspecified. And, and Mark, it's unlimited. all in my notice specifically. Yeah if we get to a resolution, if you're looking for that. Yes. And Mr. Jin, you just want, to, can you say it again, the two to four, I heard the 40 to 55 staff, two to four coach, and that's plus so one van? So it be four coach, two standard, and one van. So four coach, two standard, one van, okay. Correct. Yeah, and, and Madam Chair, um, just so it's perfectly clear, um, Right, so it's four coach, two full size, one small van. Okay. Okay, and, and you heard a lot of discussion. Three will stay on site. And yes. Three will stay on site. One, the other uh, coach will go to Simontov and Neptune. Correct. Okay, and, and Andy, you heard a lot of discussion of concern about the neighbors having to look at a bus. Correct. And knowing that schools are either permitted or conditionally permitted in just about every residential zone in New Jersey, is that common that people living near a school would be looking at buses? Very common. We've looked at, oh, quite frankly, a lot of aerials, but figured to keep it local. Uh, what you have before you as 810 is an aerial depiction of Ocean Township High School. And what you see there are the bus parking, and that's along, I'm gonna pronounce this incorrectly, Paulos Parkway, Picton Street, and Linden Street. Uh, at the high school. Um, that photo does not depict 
all the spaces uh, full, but counting out there are approximately 39 full-size buses and 22 vans parked on site. And this was taken during a typical school day. And now if one of the board members or the public may say, well, that's a much bigger lot, so they, you know, it's not as much of an impact. But are, are these buses parked in the middle of the lot or are they parked right at the property they're, line? They're at the perimeter with little to no screening. Okay, so we're actually proposing <coughs> to park our buses farther from the property line than, as shown in the picture, 10 or 15 of the buses are at the Ocean Township High School. That's correct. And have been. But, yeah, and, but the real point is it's a standard condition with schools located, and, and a lot of schools are located in residential neighborhoods. Let's remember they're conditionally permitted here, and you know buses are a part of the school operation. Okay, so in your opinion... When looking at what the Ocean Township High School does and is permitted to do and looking at what we're proposing, surrounded by trees and adding the buffer on the six-foot fence, in your opinion, will having three buses in that corner area as remote as possible from the surrounding neighbors have much of an impact on them? No, no, I don't believe so. We're, quite frankly, screening it substantially more than the public schools. And, and certainly adding one bus will not make much of a difference? No. Okay. No. So, going back to um, the restrictions, we were also looking to eliminate the restriction of 50 people from... Uh, the attendees the synagogue. Right, and right. I believe that we agreed to limit it to the two, was it 250 was the occupancy? The fire yeah. occupancy, not the fire occupancy, the number of seats in the synagogue are 250, so we certainly wouldn't look for more occupancy than the number of seats. Right. And then lastly, while well, there was a lot of testimony about it, Already, the uh, eliminate the restriction on overnight parking to help accommodate the elderly and or infirmed who at least can drive one way to services that they're required to walk. That's right. So it's the elimination on the restriction for overnight parking. Okay. Um, I think that the what we're <coughs> what we're proposing to do has been discussed and testified to at length. So let's talk about how this plays into the master plan and whether or not what we're proposing is consistent either with the original master plan or any of the amendments since uh, its inception in 1990. Certainly, and I did look at your 1990 master plan and the subsequent re-examination uh, re reports, uh, particularly focusing on the goals and objectives of those documents. Um, and those included to ensure that the land developed in the township provides a balance of land uses which help maintain the quality of life in the township for current and future citizens, to ensure that future development occurs in an orderly manner and is consistent with other development within the township, and to promote the public health, safety, morals, and general welfare of the community. Uh, synagogues and schools, both public and parochial, are conditionally permitted in the zone. We cannot neglect that these are also uh, recognized as inherently beneficial. I believe Mr. Uh, Higgins has discussed the inherently beneficial aspects of that. But uh, for, for uh, purpose of this board, the legislature defines inherently beneficial as uh, a use that is universally considered of value to the community because it fundamentally serves the public good and promotes the general welfare. Such uses include but are not limited to hospitals, schools, child care centers, group homes, wind, solar, solar and photo, photovoltaic excuse me, energy facilities or structures. In this instance, given the religious nature of the uses, we are not only satisfying the intent of the master plan through the provision of educational facilities, but also facilities that promote the development of character, good citizenship, charity, and community through their religious teachings. So that is on point with the purposes of Inherently Beneficial. It's widely recognized uh, throughout New Jersey as uh, something that the Inherently Beneficial doctrine applies to, and we notice that that in and of itself satisfies the health safety and welfare purpose of any community's objectives because of the good that it does for the community. And in any for any variance case, we have to show the positive and negative. And part of the positive is showing that the application is furthering the purposes of the municipal land use law. So which purposes, in your opinion, does this application further and why? So the MLUL lists its purposes by letter, not by number, so I'll, I'll give you the citation by letter. Uh, a is to encourage municipal action to guide the appropriate use or development of lands in the state in a matter which promotes the public health, safety, morals, and general welfare. Very much in line with what we discussed in terms of your goals and objectives. And as I said, in this case, uh, the uses here, both the synagogue and the school, reinforce the Jewish traditions, tenets, concepts, and culture through education and prayer. The, this fosters a sense of community and moral guidance and, and absolutely supports uh, Purpose A of the MLUL. 
Purpose G is to provide sufficient space in appropriate locations for a variety of agricultural, residential, recreational, commercial, and industrial uses and open space, both public and private, according to their respective environmental requirements in order to meet the needs of, of the New Jersey citizens. In this instance, we already have the facilities at the site. There is a school, there is a synagogue here. Uh, we're asking uh, essentially to uh, enlarge the utilization of those and we believe we presented testimony both from an engineering and a traffic perspective that the site can accommodate this comfortably without creating any type of nuisance we can park it we can get to it we can circulate on site um, let me ask you a question andy you brought up a good point about nuisance and some of the board member and i'm sorry not the board members i apologize some of the public through their questions was intimating that uh having a school here is a nuisance because there's noise associated with it. So let's start from the beginning. When the governing body, when a governing body zones an area as appropriate for a school, do they recognize an inherent with schools is usually having students there? When any use is considered, <laughs> whether as a principal use or, or conditional use, all the operational factors of that use are considered. Those include noise, coverage, trash, um, so yes, so when, when the governing body said this location is appropriate for schools subject to certain conditions, uh, it anticipated all those operational issues associated with schools okay. and, and synagogues. And importantly, and, and I'm only speaking about the school in this part, when schools are a conditionally permitted use, does it say that the schools can't have sports teams? No, it doesn't. Does it That's say, anticipated. Does it say that the kids can't play outside? No, it doesn't. Does it say that... Um, so in that, in that regard, is it common in a school that there would be sports games? Sports fields, playgrounds, uh, depending on the age of the children. Yeah, outdoor activities are always anticipated with schools. And, and in a school where there isn't, it's anticipated that occasionally there would be special events like a pep rally or a graduation or a winning of a sports team off-site where the children may want to celebrate or give good wishes. Yes, so, or, or something as simple as a fire drill where the students are directed outside. So, well, on a daily basis, if yeah. the kids are inside, it generally yeah. isn't. But there will always be times inherent with a school that there'll be some instances where there's noise and it might disturb the neighbors for a moment or two. But again, that's expected with a school, and that was part of the consideration when the governing body said that schools were permitted here. Correct. Okay. Correct. So one thing you left out before you get to the uh, various public and private procedures is, and I know that planners don't like to rely on it because it seems like a, a cheap one, but aesthetic improvement also, aesthetics and, and good design is also one of the purposes of municipal land use law and reinvesting into a building, beautifying it, adding more landscaping, adding a fencing, all of those aesthetic improvements also are furthering purposes yes. of the municipal land use law. One of the purposes is a desirable visual environment and quite frankly what's been proposed here is, is a very attractive addition to the property it upgrades the facility it modernizes the facility and it shows vibrancy in the facility okay and then lastly point m uh, to encourage the coordination of various public and private procedures and activities shaping land development with a view of lessening the cost of such development into the more efficient use of land and we're absolutely on point with this because what we have here are facilities that already exist that we're looking to enhance uh, within what we believe are reasonable uh, expansion expectations that we can accommodate on site, but it's there's an efficiency to doing that as opposed to finding a vacant site and doing that somewhere else. Okay, so it, it indicated that with the D3 conditional use variance, both for the school and for the synagogue, it's already recognized as a permitted use, and under Coventry Square, the test is uh, whether or not the site can accommodate it. That's correct. Okay. So based on the fact that our addition is fully compliant uh, as it relates to the existing setbacks, and we're not exacerbating any of the conditional uh, use uh, variations, in your opinion, uh, can the site accommodate the addition? Absolutely. The, ad the addition is totally compliant in terms of height, setback. We don't go over on coverage on building or total impervious. Um, so we can accommodate it. And, and the, quite frankly, the, the, it's a de minimis um, relief requested for the area because I think what we're talking about is 0.36 acres and when that translates the number of students we're talking about 18 students and that's something that's really negligible on, on and, the scale. And additionally um, 
that also goes to lot size where we're very close where you just said we're very close to the to the required lot size if we can accommodate the parking we can accommodate the setbacks we can accommodate the coverage we can accommodate all of the uses that are intended in your opinion can the site accommodate yes the site the site can reasonably accommodate the use okay and importantly as i had alluded to uh, earlier when the governing body zoned this for schools and required four acres typically a school would have outdoor activities such as either a playground for the younger kids or sports fields for the older kids that's correct in your opinion could that be part of the reason why the four acres would be required absolutely okay and it would be to give outdoor activity recreation space. recreation correct. for the kids so an important question is there was a lot of um conversation particularly from the public about existing traffic on uh the street surrounding and the proposed traffic when this is done so if if our lot size were 100 acres and we were proposing the same school so we needed no variance relief at all that would have no impact on the traffic correct no, the traffic is a is, is a function of the occupancy not the size of the lot right so the the conditional use variances are not driving um the traffic so the traffic isn't an impact of granting the variance relief because it's not really a function of the lot size the traffic is the intensity of the use and the question is whether or not the site can accommodate that intensity not whether or not the town's infrastructure can accommodate that. that that's correct and we've heard extensive testimony from our traffic engineer that the site can be properly parked can properly maneuver the buses unloading the buses parking the buses and buses egressing the site safely. and as well as parking that's right for the for the, for, for the students and for well, the guests. limited number of students that will be permitted guests and staff and, and importantly and, I, and you know I'm, I'm asking this question in a very exaggerated way there was also traffic testimony to indicate that the levels of service and the surrounding roadways <laughs> and infrastructure could actually easily accommodate the de minimis increase in traffic based on the increase in the number of students and the number That's of That's right. There wasn't a degradation in service. Okay. Um, we talked about the building height and that we're fully compliant as to the new building. And then with regard to the buffer, we're not proposing to exacerbate what is existing at eight feet. And we've agreed to actually enhance it uh, by meeting out on site with Mr. Higgins and putting up the six-foot fence. The six-foot fence and, and then the enhanced uh, height evergreen. Okay. And, and again, the buffer area that we're talking about really is not a function of the, built, the increase in the size of the school. And we're, we're willing to uh, agree not to add those additional three spaces. So we're really just talking about the one, the buffer as it relates to that one, um, that one bus spot, as well as the relocation of the trash out from the front yard into the back corner of the property. That's correct. And so, based on your opinion, is it a better zoning alternative to tuck everything where it is in the? Let me get this right. South. West corner, corner as far away from the front yards and as far away from the neighbors. That was something that was discussed at length, and yes, it is uh, certainly the best location on site for those. Okay, so in your professional planning opinion, notwithstanding the deviations uh, from the conditional use standards, can this site accommodate the use as being as is being proposed? Comfortably. Okay, so. We talked about meeting the positive criteria. We talked about meeting the po the test for uh, site accommodation. What about the negative impact uh, and what we have to demonstrate in that regard? So with respect to the negative impact, we have to. Uh, th there's two prongs to the negative test. One is that we're creating some type of substantial negative impact upon the neighbors, and that there's some kind of substantial degradation of your zone plan or any master plan. Um, in this case, the use is permitted and anticipated, both the synagogue and the school. Um, and they're operating here uh, not in tandem, but separately and at distinct times. So there's no concern in terms of overlapping operations. You've heard testimony regarding that. And importantly, though, when the board is considering the negative impact, it's not the negative impact of having a school here, and it's not the negative impact of having a synagogue here. That's already been approved. It's correct. It's just the negative impact of granting the, the variances really, that the, we're seeking the deviations that we're specifically seeking right. and that would be in terms of the shortage of 0.36 acres in lot area um, and again i don't think that creates any kind of substantial detriment because the school again operates 
we are meeting for the most part all the setbacks uh, with the new addition. The new addition is totally compliant in terms of height and setbacks. So the uh, the deviation that we're seeking for the addition uh, really doesn't have any impact on the neighbor because it is a compliant factor. Okay, and just uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So it's it's whether or not there's a substantial detriment, and it's not just a detriment, it's a substantial detriment, detriment, detriment to correct. the master plan and the zone plan. You've already testified we're entirely consistent with the master plan. Absolutely. Um, you've testified that we're essentially consistent with the zone plan because, again, the zone plan considers a school that would have more outdoor activity, which would necessitate the larger lot. Correct. And... No, oh, it was an expert testimony. Yeah. And... The um, character of the neighborhood, we're not changing the character of the neighborhood at all. The school no, is permitted. The, the school's permitted and quite frankly exists there already. Okay. And we can't ignore the fact <coughs> that both of these uses, both the uh, religious school as well as the synagogue, are federally protected by the Religious Land Use Institutionalized Persons Act. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And, and in doing that... What's the consideration? What, Generally speaking, in layman's terms, what does that statute provide by way of protection? So the statute basically states that even though these are religious uses and they're faith-based uses, that they are offered the same protections as any other use within the area. Meaning you can't... There can't be any discrimination in zoning. It has to be treated equally, and it has to be given the same That's correct. benefits. Okay. That's correct. Now, in, in this case, the R4 district uh, does permit building uh, government buildings and services as well as quasi-public uh, government buildings and purposes. And when it, in, in permitting those, it doesn't have a specific enhanced lot area. It requires the underlying lot area of 10,000 square feet, and it actually grants those uses an enhanced height of 45 feet. So when we're looking at public buildings that would be permitted here in comparison to what we're having, those those same restrictions would not apply to a public building as they're being applied right. to the school or synagogue. Understood, but again, the statute stresses and and the federal protections stress that religious uses need to be afforded um, consideration and that any zoning that would inhibit their ability to operate should be um, should be considered and any reasonable um, accommodations, accommodations should made. Be made. So in your opinion as it relates to any potential impact have we made all of the reasonable accommodations that have been asked for by the board up to now Absolutely, and we demonstrated that this evening with the changes on the exhibit. Okay. And, and we also indicated how this will operate, um, not quite at the same intensity, but very similarly with respect to bus parking as the public school. Okay. So on balance, when you look at the positive criteria and the negative criteria, has the applicant met its burden here? Absolutely. And has the applicant demonstrated that the site can accommodate the uses as proposed and the amendment to the conditions as proposed? Without detriment to the public or to the master plan and ordinance. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Andy? Questions from the board? Yes. Your <coughs> busing map for Ocean Township High School, I just want to point out, that is surrounded by privacy grounds. I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. This... Bus depot is surrounded by a privacy fence. Is it a Yes. On the west side, I that's... a high school there. I would call a chain link fence there. Yeah, and it has slats in it. Then they, maybe they added them in. They... It's been like that for a while. Okay, but they, there's no... And again, I'm not I'm not arguing with you. Yeah. There's no... Bu we're required to have a 25-foot buffer. Yeah. So, yes, there's a fence. We're putting a fence. Yeah. So we're doing the same thing that the school is doing. What I'm saying is they don't have a 25-foot buffer. Yeah. That's all. Any other questions from the board? When we talk about RELUPA, does it get into um, having restrictions placed on approvals? Uh, no, it basically says uh, it has to be treated as... No, that's... Well, from a legal a, perspective, what yeah. it says is that any restriction placed on an approval because it's a constitutionally protected right, the right to practice your religion, any um, conditions that are placed on it have to be serving a compelling governmental interest. And it really, the constitutional test. And, I, and I'm not, this board doesn't get to make decisions based on RELUPA. 
and I, I, I certainly am not arguing RELUPA here. I'm pointing out that we all know that it exists, yeah. so any conditions can't be, it's not the same as if you come in for a variance for a single family home and you need a coverage variance and you say, well, we're giving you that, so you give us this, and it's, you know, it's, it has to really be fundamentally based on a compelling government interest, and it has to be the least intrusive means for which the government can accomplish that. I'm trying to get from an inherently beneficial use of having a school at this site, and when it was approved that there was a restriction on 150 pupils, yeah. to is it inherently beneficial use that now it's going to go to 250? So I can answer that. Okay. In two, it might even be threefold, so forgive me if my numbers are off. In the first instance, the number of students doesn't change that it's an inherently beneficial use. But again, the term inherently beneficial use is important because it's given special treatment in a D1 variance. A D1, so, and I'm, I'm going to try not to make your eyes glaze over when I do this. In a, in, a, in a D1 variance, you have to prove the positive and the negative. You have to prove that the site is particularly suited, and then you have to reconcile it. It's called the Medici test. And you have to reconcile the, allowing the use when the zoning doesn't allow for it. And what the courts have said is with an inherently beneficial use, they get special treatment. They don't have to reconcile. They don't have to go through the Medici test. All they have to do is go through the SICA test, which is a four-prong test, to demonstrate that they did everything they could to mitigate the impact. I'm simplifying it, but that's where inherently beneficial is. So when, when Andy's saying this is inherently beneficial, we're saying... Not only is it a conditional use, so you don't look at it with the same stringent test as a D1 variance, but even if you did, it's an inherently beneficial use. So in the first instance, inherently beneficial doesn't necessarily translate in the conditional use context. And as far as being inherently beneficial, the inherently beneficial use, part of it goes to what the need is. And again, the, the number of students, a synagogue is inherently beneficial whether there's 10 people, which is the minimum for a minyan, or there's 1,000 people. The benefit remains the same. Um, and as far as what occurred back in 2011 versus now, in 2011, it was introducing a new, it, two things occurred there, three things. I wasn't the attorney at the time. The school was desperate had already closed on the property and was desperate to get in and was willing to agree to just about anything in order to do so they needed to get up and operating so unfortunately they didn't have the forethought of the future and the growth that might occur in the surrounding area and the need for the school and then the third thing that's most important and something that i think you might remember we've done with several of the day camps we didn't have a track record we were telling you what and when I say we, I mean they and the other attorney, they were telling you what they expected by way of cars, but they had no way to show you. So now we've been there for 12 years, and now we're coming back to you with actual parking counts to say, we came in, we agreed to this limitation because we had to get in, and we didn't need more than that because we didn't have any more students than that. We've been here for more than a decade. We know exactly how many people drive and what our needs are going to be. So now here's a traffic report showing it. So I don't know that we could have made the same argument with the site accommodating it at the higher number until we had been there for a decade to show that we could. So I think those are the distinctions, but it certainly, it, the board does not take into consideration, is it more inherently beneficial or less inherently beneficial based on the number? Again, inherently beneficial is really just a, a side. And I'm gonna turn to Jim to make sure I said everything correctly. Yeah, I think so. The inherently beneficial aspect of it, <coughs> I think, adds to the benefit of the use, and it's like the 800-pound gorilla in a room. It, it does add some significance to the nature of the use and to what the board should consider. But what you really need to consider is the fact that this is a D3 variance, that what they're proposing, the, de the deviations, that they can be supported by the site. And if that's the case, then the variances should be granted. But inherently beneficial, I think, does add to the, to the validity of the use and something the board should consider, but it should not be a major consideration in your decision. Uh, uh, like, I think what uh, Mr. Janu was saying is that based on 
the area of this lot and the number of students that if you just limited the students to the area of, of the lot that there's an 18 student difference between the, the 260 and I guess it would be 242. So what you need to consider is given the fact that there are no outdoor activities at the site, that they're not really not having any additional sub substantial variances in terms of bulks to the site, and whether that 18 additional students is going to cause something that, that makes the site not, not able to accommodate the use. But I think the fact that it's, the uses are inherently beneficial does, does play into a factor of, of your decision, but it shouldn't be a major factor. Just to but but if I, and as Ms. Krimko said, if this was a D1 variance where the use wasn't permitted, it would we wouldn't even be talking about the number of students. We would be talking about the fact it's inherently beneficial right. that <coughs> they would go through the four-part SICA test, Understood. and the SICA yeah. test goes through the detriments, and then what you can do to eliminate the detriments, and then says that you should approve it unless the detriments substantially outweigh the benefits, which is the opposite of every other variance that so you're looking at. I think, Mr. Fuller, my, our point with mentioning inherently beneficial is we believe that even if this wasn't a permitted use at all and we needed a D1, mm -hmm. because of its inherently beneficial <laughs> status can bestowed upon it by our state legislature, we would qualify for a D1 use variance. If you can qualify for a D1 variance, then clearly you can qualify for the lesser standard, which is a D3 variant. Yeah. That's really the intention of why we brought it up. Mm -hmm. And when we get into, you were mentioning the 18 students, if 90 students... No, no, no. What, what he meant by that was that Person, the way your ordinance... The way eight, your right? ordinance... I'm trying to say it to make sure I have it right. Yeah, so the way your ordinance is asking, written... And I say, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you're asking for a 90 student increase. Mm -hmm. What you're testifying to is... Based on the numbers, you could get to 242. No, 232. We're asking for 232. 250, not 260. Right. It's 250. Right. The area where shy translates to 18 students. By dividing the students per acre. Yeah. And you're asking for 250, which is 18 more than the numbers technically line up. Correct. But it's not a standard. It's you need four acres, and they have a little less than four acres. If you, you want to yeah, play with those to, numbers, you're trying can. to relate it. Yeah, but right. Okay. Thank you. Any other <clears throat> any other questions for Mr. Janu? Okay. At this time, we will have questions from the public from Mr. Janu. Is anyone from the public? If you can please come up to. Do you have a mic, Madam Chair? We have several, just not one where we need it right now. So um, if you I think can just you can put that one on the end, and I can let Andy use this one if you want to put yours on the corner of the table. Sure. And you can state your name and your address, and you may ask your question. Yes. Uh, John Waldron, twelve oh seven Herbert Avenue. Uh, I just want to go back to the Ocean Township reference. Um, yes. How long has Ocean Township High School? been established since the 60s, 50s, yeah. right I mean that's a very very long time we're talking about Is this a question, Mr. yes yes the question is um, if can you honestly compare that to a, a 12 year old school they have done it okay they are comparing it the answer is is after the question period session will be open to the public right. and you can then say to the board how can you do that and I don't think you should that's a comment at this point you're asking a question but I just I wanted to know how how long Ocean Township right. has been in the, I believe in the early 60s yeah I think that's correct 60s are, yeah. all right thank you any other well, questions? I have a different oh. question if you know it Mr. Jenner yes Was the school built at the same size with the same number of buses and the same number of students in the 60s as it would now in 2023? So, yeah, as I say, based, certainly 
the school has grown over the times. And, and there's been additions. I was looking at the rooftops here. It looks like there have been several additions to the school over the years. Okay. So it's typical that as schools uh, exist from inception to a decade or more later, the student body often grows and the building often grows. Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at the demographics of Ocean Township, they've changed significantly since the 60s. Thank you. Okay, any other questions from the public? Um, recognizing the young lady in the back and then the gentleman with the green shirt. Okay, if you can state your name, address, and ask your question. Thank you. Valerie Bruno, 2301 Logan Road. Um, I just had a question and I'm not sure if you're able to answer it for me or if Ms. Krimko is able to answer it for me, but is the building open to the public for worship? Of course. Okay. So anyone's free to go in and participate in worship, it's a, participate it, in service? It, certainly. It, I don't know whether or not there has to be, you have to be a member of the congregation. For example, most synagogues on the high holidays, you have to buy a ticket. You okay. can't just go. Um, most churches, you know, sometimes you have to marathon on busy times you have to arrange in advance but is it open for Judaic prayer to people other than just those who attend the school yes it is and to those who are considered members of the congregation is it open to non members so there are several different types of Jews and you could be worshiping in a synagogue and not be a part of a specific congregation. So again, I would imagine that yes, that anyone looking to pray as part of the minyan or pray as part of the celebration could attend that during services. Thank you. And um, also I was wondering about community because it was referenced earlier as to you know, the benefit of the community. This, this I was just wondering if, well, the witness here referenced it. So I was wondering if you would be able to define community. What is a community? So the community is overall what, what, uh, what is taught at any of the school, quite frankly, is, is charity and community impact. And it's encouraged to interact with your community, both local and, and, and greater community. So when you're instilling values in students, and that's why it's one of those inherently beneficial uses, that includes giving back to the community. That's in your words, though. Is that? I, I think that's part of any. Do you consider kind of residents of Ocean Township to be a part of a community? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Andy, I want to go a step further. In order to be inherently beneficial use, it doesn't have to serve the community immediately around it. Is that correct? No, it could be the broader. And in order to be an inherently beneficial use or to further the purposes of the municipal land use law by um, furthering the, the general welfare, it doesn't have to be a benefit right. to the entire community or any particular community. When you say <clears throat> community, that means more of a nebulous community at large. Yes. Okay. Yes. Universal community. Universal community. Right. So if you have a school, it's inherently beneficial whether it serves the 100 people around it or it serves people from the town next door doesn't have to be benefit the Ocean Township Oakhurst community. It just has to service the human the community. community. Right. So, would, would serve society. Society. Large. Yes. yes. For morality, for mm -hmm. exactly. education, for and charity. And I think that's where Ms. Bruno yes. was yes. going with her question. So again, it doesn't have to necessarily <coughs> serve the neighbors. Right. Thank right. you. OK. Yes, sir. You can come up, please. And state your name, your address, and your question. My name is David Miller, 1203 Herbert Avenue, Ocean. Uh, I just have a question in regard to the traffic issue. You did mention the fact that you did a traffic uh, review on the parking lot. So, no, I referenced our traffic engineer's review. Okay. How, how about the traffic on the outside of the... Building. Again, I referenced the our traffic engineer's findings with respect to that. I didn't and perform. Mr. Miller, he can't testify as to the traffic. But if you remember, we had a traffic expert hearing. You were able to ask him questions. Yes, but he only gave the parking lot. 
No, I believe his report spoke as to the roads and the questions about. No, it was Any other questions from the public? Okay, seeing none. Um, motion to close the. Uh, well, we're, gonna, we're not ready to close. The public now has an opportunity, but I don't know if there's time to come and comment and and talk and give the board their opinion and and reasons uh, in this matter. And, and we have a five minute time limit for each person. And I don't know how many people want to speak, but I believe we're out of time for tonight. And I think the public has come out for, you know, this is the third hearing. But I, I think we should allow them to speak. I'm sorry, Ms. Krimka. Your client was offered to have a special meeting and has decided not to do so. So the other cases need to have the same weight as your client this evening. So we're, we're past the 45 minute mark. I apologize to those who came out without having time to comment, but. We need, to move Chair? we need to move forward with the other cases. Yes. Okay, so we're carrying this for public comment. Well, I just, uh, let's just make sure that anybody else has any questions of Mr. Janu and his testimony in case he's not here next month. He's not going to be here. Right, I know. So mm -hmm. if anybody has any questions of him as to his testimony tonight? We may be here, but not. Well, I understand. Not but presenting. Not presenting. So there are no other questions. Um, so the next procedure in this application would be anybody who wants to speak for or against the application to the board, present any evidence that they may have, or present any experts that they may have, and that would be at the next meeting. Okay. And I, you know, hopefully we'll conclude at that. Right, it would be subject only to my closing statements. Which will be September 21st. Now, without further notice, Madam Chair? Correct. It will be carried to the meeting of September 21st, 2023, 7.30 p.m. live. In same this. Place, same time. Yes. Without further public notice or without further advertisement. 821. Next is um, Not yet. You. Not, actually, not you. It's actually not you. Okay, the next case is John Radigan, Block 153.04, Lot 6, 2 Water Mill Court, Ocean, Zone R3. This applicant is seeking approvals to keep a pool surround constructed within the side yard setback and in violation of the conditions of the zoning approval. And Mr. Radigan, okay, you can uh, raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth? Yes, I do. Okay. And I will ask Mr. Higgins and Mr. Matlack if they will provide their report. I will briefly read into the record. Um, stated August 13th, the applicant is requesting variance approval to maintain a pool that was constructed within a required side yard setback and to maintain a gravel area that extends to within, and for some reason I didn't finish that sentence, but it's to within the uh, required side and rear yard setback. Uh, Variance is accessory structure setback. The ordinance requires that accessory structures, including swimming pools, patios, etc., maintain the required 10 foot side yard setback. The sweat subject swimming pool was constructed 9 feet from the side yard. In addition, the stone area, which appears to be a patio, is set back 1 foot to the side yard and 0 feet to the rear yard. With regard to the pool side yard setback, the deviation is minimal. The site is adequately screened from the adjacent property, which is occupied by the neighbor's driveway. With regard to the <coughs> side and rear yard setbacks of the stone patio area, the applicant should describe the use of these areas. While the ordinance would permit a small area of stone <coughs> mulch and flower bed, it appears that these areas are used as active patio spaces and not flower beds. The intent of the ordinance is to allow adequate screening and space between active recreation areas and adjacent properties. The applicant should provide information regarding the adequacy of screening in these areas, particularly the rear yard area of the residence 
that is adjacent to the site, which it also appears to be a pool area. Okay, Mr. Matlock. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> uh, so, I prepared two reports for this application. My initial report had no engineering comments. Uh, a subsequent re report was issued after the zoning officer identified that uh, there were, was a, 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 a surface surrounding the pool was not grass as shown on the original as-built plan, but it was some kind of stone area. Uh, so my my comments were that the applicant should provide some testimony regarding the, the uh, area surrounding the pool and the patio. Uh, basically, what type of surface is it? Maybe uh, a description of the stone, how, how that may affect uh, any neighboring properties. Okay, Mr. Radigan, if you can um, tell us about your request and also include responses uh, for Mr. Matlack's concerns. Yes. So um, when the pool was engineered, um, the impervious surface when the um, contractor came out with uh, offshore pools, uh, they said they could do three feet around the pool and they laid out what, in, what can and cannot be used for, or cover cement. Uh, so with that being said, I said, what can we do? What can we, we cover the remaining area with? They said either with stone or with grass. So with that being said, I figured grass is going to go into the pool. The obvious uh, solution I thought was to put stone because they said to put stone. So I put stone around the pool like I was instructed to uh, because I couldn't put any more cement. So I covered that up. Um, the stone is gooseneck stone that I put down myself. Um, there's no drainage issues, no complaints from the neighbors. Um, you can't even st uh, put a chair or anything on the stone because it's not level. And it's, um, you know, if you put a chair down, you're possibly going to fall out of your chair. So it's non, non used uh, surface, basically. And uh, the, pet, the question I know was there was a Google Earth picture of my backyard. That corner that was in question, there was two uh, plastic Adirondack chairs from Walmart that we put there just to take up space for like a decoration. And that, that was it. The, the surface is not used at all. Is the stone relatively uh, uniformly graded, meaning the, the, s the sizes of the stone are about all about the same, Could or do you have like larger stone and then smaller stone? They're, they're, I, got, I got them from New Jersey sand and gravel. Um, there's big ones and medium-sized ones. Um, you don't have like uh, very boulders? fine particles like no, so, no. Uh, silt and soil in there? Okay. So th that, the reason I ask that is because it's, uh, it's what you call a, a clean stone, um, which is, is washed gravel, uh, so it has void space. It's not, uh, it doesn't create a, a compacted hard surface. It doesn't create, uh, generate runoff. Uh, so it, it essentially uh, will store water instead of allowing it to run off. So I don't have an issue with, with that. Okay. Any other testimony, Mr. Radigan? Uh, no, if you have any questions, I'll answer them. Questions from the board? How does it walk across a stone and bare feet? Uh, hurts. That's my kids. <laughs> okay, any other question? Oh. What, what do you use that gravel area for then? Nothing. Nothing? There's nothing on it. Okay. There's no. no landscaping or anything in it? Landscape? There's there's the mulch beds around it, um, and then in that corner is just is just um, just the stone. There's no there, we don't sit on it. It's it's graded downwards. Um, there's no flooding issues. No complaints from the neighbors. Do we have pictures? Not in the packet. No, we have. Just the. Um, I I have a picture of it. I apologize. I didn't make enough copies. I didn't know. This is my first time at a variance so why board. Don't we, why don't we mark that? You can give you it to Clay. As uh, A1, they're all the same pictures? I see this more. Uh, yeah, because I, I believe the, the, the question was there was a drainage, possibly a drainage issue. Um, there is a drain on, on the property line that's there, uh, so I just took a picture of that. Uh, but are those three pages are all the same? The, no. Oh, oh, no, they're not. Okay, it's, it's a packet. Okay. Yes. It's a three page packet. Three page packet. Together. Yes. A1. Uh, A1 would be a three-page package showing what? What do they show? Sir? It's the corner, uh, the corner in question, of just the the stone. And what else? The the picture of the uh, the drain that's on the property line. The third one. And the third one is the picture of the corner where, from a distance away, and a circle around it where the drain would be from if looking from a distance. 
to pass it to the board members and we can pass it this way when you finish the professionals and maybe it'll give you a better explanation of what we have there. So this is the first A1 is all of those areas. Is the, the, the corner. Or just this one. It's just that one. Okay. Based on the, the diagram that you have, whatever, wherever the, um, the cement ends, mm -hmm. that type of stone around those. Okay. So, so the, I had a question. The pool, there's two issues: the stone itself, and then the sidewalk, or the sorry, the concrete around the pool is also within. So the pool itself is nine feet from the property line, where we require ten. Yeah. So that means so the variance, unless you want to remove the pool. Yeah. The, okay. the, well, they're not permitted. Um, they're permitted a three foot surround after the pool, mm -hmm. um, three feet. And they would not need a variance if it was three feet. Even with the nine foot setback, three feet is allowed. It's mm -hmm. considered a walkway as opposed to a patio. Once you get past three feet, it becomes a patio. Patios have to be 10 feet also on the real yeah. property line, on the side property line, or whatever it is. Mm. So by making it all stone, it is considered a patio. May I ask the, the distance from the, uh, the side of the pool, the, the actual sidewalk, how, long, how far is it gravel? 10 feet? From the corner of, of the of the of the property, yeah. From the mulch to the, I would say probably yeah, close to close to ten feet at, at the most at the at most distant part, unless it's on the diagram uh, on the survey. Okay, because this photo looks like the whole backyard is graveled, correct? Not the whole backyard; it's just surrounding the pool. Where wherever I could, wherever the three foot of cement stops, mm -hmm. it was either I was either told grass or stone. Who so, told you? Who told you? The, the pool company. The pool yeah, company. Well, well, they don't work for the town. Well, <laughs> I, know, I know, I know, I hear you. Thank you. Jim, that's not just a little gravel. That's what it looks like. That's the great. So I, before he interrupted me, so if, if if the gravel the gravel is considered a patio, and that it's too close, it's right up to the property line almost. So that's that's what they're talking about here. As a sec, two variances, one for the quote unquote patio, <coughs> and one for the pool. I, I have a question. Where does the that uh, grate that drain lead to? Is that is it I, just like I a believe it leads, pipe underground? It's or? it's not uh, it's on the original survey when I moved in in two thousand thirteen. I believe it goes to the sewer. The street. Do you want me to sit, would you like me to submit this? Mr. Matlack, are there concerns about where that? No, I just want to want to make sure to. that um, it's it either it has an outlet or it, it drains into the ground to as a, it's kind of acting like a dry well or a recharge trench. Um, I'm not seeing it on the original. He's uh, he's. But do you have something in the original? Yes, yeah. this is what I moved in in 2013 when it was provided. I think that's up to four now. A4? No? Oh, A2. Sorry. Mr. Malik, would you consider the stone impervious then? No, I, I don't think I would consider that impervious. It's, uh, it's, stone is, is not considered impervious, uh, and I don't know exactly how Ocean's Ordinance is written. Some ordinances say that stone yeah. can be impervious if it has uh, it, it used for a driveway where it could be compacted by motor vehicles. Um, yeah. But I would not consider it impervious. 
And the ordinance is silent to that. It talks about impervious areas, but it doesn't define them. That's my question. And it, it doesn't permit stone mulch and planting beds. But it doesn't say you can't have a stone area. Jim, let's get together. It appeared from the aerials that it was being utilized as a patio. And the zoning officer looked at that and felt that it was a patio, and therefore it wasn't permitted. But based upon those pictures, it seems the opposite? It's, it is definitely not a, a patio like like the pool surround. Yeah. It's not, it's yeah. not concrete. It's, it's not, not a permanent structure. Right. Uh, it's the, the applicant's testimony is that he's not using it as a patio, um, and it looks like it's just a, a stone area. I, I think that's it's really the board's dis decision on mm -hmm. uh, whether you would consider it a patio or not. So it's almost as if we need to get rid of the Walmart chairs so it doesn't <laughs> seem like a patio. Yes. I, I threw them out. <laughs> well, guess, so, like, the other the other thing is that the, the zoning officer has made a decision that it's a patio. So for you to you you would really have to grant the variance because that's her decision, and the only way that could change would be if her decision were appealed to you, and that you were to then override her decision and say it's not a patio. So as as it stands now with her decision, it's a patio. Okay, so the variances would be for the, for the setback in the, yeah. uh, where was it? Um, I just lost it, I just had it. Um, setback is it's supposed to be 10 feet. Can we put a restriction on it that the patio can be nothing but stone as part of the? You can. And this is no reflection on the applicant because he could sell the house tomorrow. Is that it's a real enforcement issue? I mean, how, how are you going to enforce it? Well, every, everything's an enforcement issue, what? right? But but I guess what you're saying is, yeah. based on what you just said, that it's now considered a patio. Yeah, if we approve yeah. stone that no one's going to lay out on um, yeah. as a patio, then the homeowner could then turn around and put down an patio. actual patio. Well, yeah, that's no, the. I couldn't, I couldn't put down a permanent structure because there's a plan before the board, and any approval would be subject to the specifics of that plan. Okay. Same okay. thing. It's going to be subject to it being the stone. Yeah. Okay. It's clearly something in the ordinance that needs to be looked at. And okay. Any other questions from board members? Questions from the public? Okay, motion to close the public hearing. Motion to close the public hearing. A second. Uh, Claire, please call the roll. Fuller. Yes. 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 Okay, and is there um, an offer regarding variances? Well, uh, why, uh, the first one would be to the pool is one foot off. So, you know, I'd probably take them separately. Yeah. Okay. You know, I don't know how the board's going to go. Well, let's, I don't know, we have to take them separately because I don't want to do two resolutions okay. <laughs> okay. and two votes. Um, the first variance he needs is 10 feet for the, uh, excuse me, yeah, 10 feet for the pool, and he has nine. The second variance is, is that he has a, what the zoning officer is considered a patio, and whether or not, and the patio doesn't meet the, the setback requirement at all, and whether or not you want to grant a variance to that to remain, or if you want to deny that part, then you'd have to remove it. Just the stone. Yeah, right. so you, you, want, you can yeah. deny, you can grant the pool and deny the patio, Right. And then he would be in violation if he doesn't remove the stone and put grass down. I'm prepared to make a motion for positive resolution on both, both pieces. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. 
Claire, please call the roll. What was the motion? For both patio and uh, pool. Was there a second? I'm just for the variance. Yes, it was. Both variances. Yeah, both variances. The patio and the pool. The, is the, the patio up to the property line? Right. And yeah. The, and the rear it is on the side is within one foot. Okay, so it's rear, zero, mm -hmm. and side it's one foot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Ashkenazi? Yes. Cisnero? Yes. Kaplan? Yes. Manasky? Yes. Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Okay. Good luck, Mr. Radigan. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. um, next case, Mike McLaughlin, Block 61.03, Lot 8, 628 North Edgemere Drive, Ocean, Zone R4. This applicant is seeking approvals to construct the second story addition, covered front porch, covered rear patio, AC condenser, existing generator, and driveway on a pre-existing non-conforming dwelling with variances, for minimum front, 30 feet required, 19.9 feet proposed, and rear, 30 feet required, 3.6 feet proposed, yard setbacks, maximum building coverage, 27% permitted, 30.5% proposed, accessory structure setback, and minimum driveway site setback, where 5 feet is required and 1.1 1 .1, uh, feet proposed. And Mr. McLaughlin? You can raise your right hand, and uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth? Okay, and will anyone else be giving testimony? Jenna McLaughlin. Okay, Ms. McLaughlin, if you can also raise your right hand, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth? Yes. Okay, and... Your architect. Architect. Mr. Pass... Donald Passman. Passman, correct. Okay. And Mr. Passman, I know you've testified before the board. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth? Yes, I do. Okay, Mr. Higgins and Mr. Matlack. I think at, at this point, well, there are a number of variances. It's a very unusually shaped lot. I think there's some hardships there. I think if Mr. Passman can describe what they want to do and what they want to do it, I think that would be more efficient than me reading my report to the board. Basically, I don't, I don't have a concern with the application, even though there are a lot of variances because of the nature of the site and the nature of what they want to do. Okay, Mr. Matlack. Uh, the only comments that I had were uh, that the uh, the driveway is, is being widened and it's not being proposed with a new driveway apron, which I would recommend uh, because you've got uh, you can now have a, a combination of paved and concrete driveway. So I think a, a reconstruction of that would would make sense. Um, and uh, then just a brief summary of the uh, roof leader collection system. There's some under drains in there. Uh, from the applicant, and, and other than that, I don't really have any other concerns. Okay. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. McLaughlin, if you can tell us about your, <coughs> excuse me, request, and if you can address Mr. Matlack's questions. Oh, okay. Um, we've been in 2016, our family's growing, and essentially we wanted to do these additions to stay here for the long haul. Okay. And Mr. Passman, do you have more testimony? I can, uh, I can go through uh, some of what Mr. Higgins and Mr. Matt might have to say. So me. Um, as far as the, the, the uh, existing property, I don't know if you have an existing survey uh, or a survey uh, topo that was done by Mr. Sermont, Charles Sermont, um, in January 26, 23, but it shows what the property is now in terms of the house. <clears throat> There's a two-story portion of a house, uh, the main part of the house, with a one-story portion to the east that's mostly a garage and some other ancillary space closer to the house, and a one-story portion on the west side, which is used to be a porch, must have been converted to a covered enclosed den or something. So the proposal, which is shown in my submittal, <clears throat> is to expand uh, those two one-story pieces. Um, but just to get in general uh, on the plan, I can show you something a little more obvious is uh, by way of the hardship of the size, the shape of the lot. The size of the lot is greater than the 10,000 square feet uh, permitted in the zone or required in the zone. It's 10,900, but it's triangular in shape. So it gives you this as the setbacks. 
And when I first started this project, I asked uh, the zoning officer. Um, you haven't submitted that before tonight, right? No. It, it's you just a mark, clarification of what's on the what Well, We can submit this if you want. Mark it in. Just mark, it, mark it in. Mark it in. I have uh, three of those. <coughs> okay, so that's A1, and that's uh, the depiction of the... That is a depiction of the setbacks with respect to this triangular lot. Okay. And it's in pink. The setbacks are marked, marked in pink, so you can see a little bit better than what's on the site plan that was submitted. <laughs> and the point of this is that I had asked the zoning officer, what is the, I know what the front is, what is the side and what is the rear? So she determined that the west side was the rear. I can't remember exactly why, but that's the way we determined it. <clears throat> so based on that, obviously there's a lot of variances. Uh, on that side of the property. Just inherently in anything that we do, there's almost a variance. What we did try to avoid is any variances on the east side, just because it was closer the way it is now. And that corner of the house that's, that was one story is now two stories is the same corner. We moved the addition forward to get more space in that uh, dimensionally for that two story addition. Um, <clears throat> on the east side, the one-story thing that was a porch, maybe, and became a den, is now a two-story structure that is also expanded toward the front. Uh, and the purpose of that is mostly on the second floor to get bathrooms for the children's bedrooms up above. And you can see that on the plan when I get to it. I'm just going through kind of the site right now. Uh, as far as the front yard, uh, the owner... The owners were very interested in having a better aesthetic to the house. Right now, it's, a, it's like a colonial brick and so forth. And so there's no front porch or anything. So this gave them the opportunity to put a front porch on with some interesting aesthetics. And it violated the front yard setback. Uh, not only the porch, but also the stairs. Because in Ocean Township, the steps have to meet the full 30-foot front yard setback. So this just give you an idea of why we're here for all these uh, all these variances that Mr. Higgins had mentioned. There's, there's quite a few. So that's just a start. The next thing is I'll enter this into evidence if it has, hasn't already been entered, is a, uh, a grading and drainage plan from Charles Sermon. Again, dated uh, 41823. Okay, we have that in our packet. You have that, okay. It, 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 you need to mark the board's packet B1. John, Yes. Make sure we do that each time. We are marking the packet so, of B1. But we, so, I forgot. Okay. You forgot. <laughs> doesn't know. She knows. She, she, didn't she knows that. So as far as that B1, that addressed uh, Mr. Matlack's concerns about drainage that I think uh, hopefully this will answer his questions about the drainage part of the project. So that sort of encompasses the site. As far as the floor plan, I can get to that architecturally to, to show you why we did what we did and... Uh, what the impact is on the, the setbacks. Actually, uh, part of it is that we're asking for setback relief, but uh, the coverage part of it, we're also asking for for building coverage, not impervious coverage. Um, <clears throat> uh, the lot coverage for buildings is stated to be a maximum of 27%. The existing house is, uh, and it's pieces are 17.9 percent. What we're requesting is 30.5 percent. And where and it's broken down on my zoning chart, which is on my sheet A1, part of your packet, uh, where it talks about living area as a footprint, the front covered porch, the rear covered porch, and there's a, a shed for 128 square feet. But those porches, and I have the percentages shown, <clears throat> the living area is, is uh, as a footprint is 20.4 percent which is well under the 27. The front cover porch is 5.2%. Now that's a 25.6. And then we add the rear cover porch at 3.2% and then 1.5% for the shed. All those add up to 30.5. But a lion's share of this overage, which is 8.4%, and has the square footage on there also, is what takes us over the coverage. And uh, they're meant to be aesthetic improvements in the front, mostly for the porch. Uh, in the rear, it's more of a useful thing where it's a, uh, uh, it faces south, so just a patio would just get burned. Right now they have like a, umbrellas or a, an awning kind of structure out there. This is going to be a permanent structure that fits in with the character of the house, and it gives shade for that, uh, for when they're enjoying the rear yard. Are they both open or 
open, unenclosed, but roofed with columns. So let me go to the plan. So I kind of discussed the, the, the site, the zoning chart, and the site plan, and that pink delineated setback, which is why we have some of these variances for the addition over the one-story portion. Plus, there's a generator that's already there. There's AC units that are already in the setback. These are things that could not be avoided. I tried desperately to try to get this covered patio in the rear to conform. The patio itself doesn't, but the actual <coughs> area does conform to that pink side of the setback. So there is a, an unfinished basement existing, and we're adding crawl space. On the first floor, again, the, the, the house is being added on. It's a shaded area, which shows the addition to the front and the second story addition over that and over the one story portion. You know, on the, on the west side, there's a two story portion added to make the actually larger, mostly to accommodate the second floor's bathroom, which I need to explain to the twins. We have boy girl twins, and we would like them to each have their own bathroom growing up. So, there are the existing bedrooms that are in, this, in the house now, and there's a roof over this den. Now it becomes one bathroom and another bathroom for each of us. Also, the second floor is only one other bathroom, so the existing master bedroom is turned into a guest bedroom, and then there's a primary suite which has its own bathroom as well. So that, that's the footprint, which really is not really changing at all, except a little bit in the front on either side. The front porch is what's coming across the house and giving this the aesthetic character to change it, to make it more colonial, or if you want to call it that. And so, by looking at the elevation, you can see that you know there's the brick is being taken off and putting it on your side. And we have a whole front porch with a front portico that extends out just a little bit to accept the stairway. And then there's an octagonal feature on the corner and it takes around the side to that one story and the two story uh, den space. Uh, on the other side, we uh, have the again, master primary suite over here. And a family room and the garage. The little side entrance. I'll go through this quickly to get a question. But the idea is to really uh, enhance the, the entire aesthetics. There's a, a small uh, shed, uh, and there's, there's no more garage. <coughs> what's, the, what's the size of this shed? 128 square feet. And it, it meets the setback requirements of uh, accessory structure. It's, uh, no, it doesn't. No, no, it does. no, no, hold it. It's, it's in the front yard. It's in the front yard. It's in the front yard. It doesn't need to set. Where is it no, on? It's, it's not in the front yard. It's in the side yard. Oh, is that what the side is? It's yeah. in the side yard. Set yeah, side yeah, it means a side yard setback. Yeah. What about the front yard setback? So you, you indicate here that it does. No, no. It needs 10 foot, it needs 10 foot side and rear. Yeah, so it's, it's, it doesn't meet the side. It's only only needs five feet. It's not on. It's not. Yeah, let me check. What's that. the height it's of it? Behind, it's behind the front yard setback. What's yeah. the height of the? Less than 10 feet. Okay. Okay. Ten feet. Front yard. It's 120 square feet, you said? 128. 128. Okay. 16 feet by 8. If it's it's a five foot side yard setback. Donna's right. Okay. So he meets the five yep. foot setback. Okay. Yeah, he meets that. That's why it's not murder for it. <laughs> what is in your report? No, it isn't. It isn't. Well, the way you placed it. No. It says ten foot side and rear. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but that's for the patio. Okay. So he meets. He doesn't need a variance for the for the shed. Shed. Or the. But he needs a variance for the patio. Misnumerals on this uh, setback on the chart. So I have corrected those with the driveway setback of 
okay. and also the uh, front frontage. Okay. Definitely need change. Okay. And that's more those that the check. Pardon? You submitted those? No, I can't. You do now? I got three of those. Let's mark them as, uh, what do we have to, A2 for them? A2, and let me have one B. for the chart. B. No. Those are on the, the revised zoning chart. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, the plans for the revised zoning, press one around there, okay. They may want to see it. It's just a revised zoning chart. This is a chart that shows the numbers that Mr. Reagan's had mentioned. Do you want to see it? That's fine. Chart. What? Do you want to see it? No. You said he did it. He said he did it. Okay, <laughs> but I'm going to take that for the two other numbers. Okay, any other? As far as the uh, oh, you know, my testimony about what I've done in the house and so forth, I'm willing to answer any questions. Okay. Any questions from the board? Okay. Questions from the public? Uh, you can come up. Yes, that's fine. So, uh, if you can just talk in the mic. We're on questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. You, uh, apologize. You said you don't have a question, you have a comment. So we'll close for um, questions and then any final comments. Okay. So just hold on right there. Any questions from the public? Okay, a motion to close. Any, any further um, testimony? We're just excited to stay in this community and be able to watch our kids grow here. So we appreciate you listening to us today. Thank you. Okay, um, motion to, no, I'm sorry. Comments from, we'll say comments from the board first. Any comments? No? Okay, comments from the public. If you can state your name, your address, and your comment. Yes, Sean Heater, 615 Blanchard Parkway. We share a uh, backyard and side yard property line. Um, as the McLaughlins are a great family, and uh, we look forward to having them in our community, being our neighbors. And I've seen the plans, totally support everything they presented. I also submitted a letter today, and it was indicated that I needed to come by so my letter could be pushed forward. So there is a letter that probably... The board won't say letter. That's your testimony. Your testimony. Excellent. Yes. It's a learning experience for me, too, so thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Okay. okay. All right, a motion to close the public hearing. Motion to close. Okay, Claire. It's a tough lot. Yes. 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 Okay. Will someone offer for the? Uh, um, Mr. Matlack, did Mr. Passman address your issues with the? Yes. Um, um, yeah, I don't have any any concerns. Okay. Uh -huh. I can't tell if you're like trying to say something here or there. Okay, um, will someone offer for the variances? I'll second. Okay, Claire. Subject to the condition a better in Matt's letter concerning the driveway. Yes. Mr. Passman, Mr. Passman. <coughs> or Mr. Matlick, is there any um, additional testimony that you need for the condition regarding the driveway? Uh, it, is the is the condition acceptable that the driveway apron would be um, reconstructed as part of the driveway uh, expansion? Yes. Okay. Okay. That's okay. Fine. And I. I Okay, that's the block. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, our next case, Overbrook Property, LLC. 
Block 22, Lot 42, Overbrook Avenue, Oakhurst, Zone R4. Applicant seeks approval to construct a new three-story dwelling with open front and rear porches, along with an in-ground pool with the within the floodplain. With variances for maximum lot coverage, building in a floodplain, and maximum stories. Attorney for the applicant is Ms. Jennifer S. Krimko. Hi, how are you? Again, Jennifer Krimko on behalf of the applicant. And according to Jim's letter, uh, the number of stories variances went away, right, Jim? Yeah. So, again, just very briefly, this is simply one of those matters where the entire lot is in a floodplain. So, we need a variance in order to construct it. Um, if we were not in a floodplain, we'd be conforming in building coverage and in lot coverage. So really the variance is triggered by the fact that we have a zero buildable lot area. Okay. Mr. Higgins. Okay. <clears throat> if the variances that are necessary, the first is the ordinance requires that all uh, buildings be constructed on a lot with, on an improved, improved right of way. Basically says the ordinance requires that all front yards face on a minimum 50 foot wide right of way for the required front of the lot. No building or use shall be permitted on a lot unless the lot is above the required frontage on a minimum 50 foot right of way and such frontage has been improved in accordance with the minimum municipal standards for one half of the width of the right of way. At the discretion of the municipal engineer, such improvements have been guaranteed, or by the, at the discretion of the municipal engineer, such improvements have been guaranteed by cash or bond. In this case, the site requires a lot frontage of 54 feet and approximately 74 feet of the site fronts on Overbrook Avenue. So as far as the required frontage fronting on a, a public street, it meets that requirement. But Overbrook is only 40 feet wide, the right of way, and it's supposed to be 50 feet wide. So a variance would be necessary for frontage on a 50 foot wide right of way that's improved for half of its width. Uh, for that 54 feet deep into the lot. And basically, <clears throat> when I look at it, this is a dead-end street. It's not going anywhere. And Overbrook, once you get to the site, functions more as a driveway than a street. I don't have a problem with the granting of the variance, provided that Ben doesn't have a problem with it, that there's not engineering issues. If it was a, th if it was a through street <coughs> or a much longer street that accessed other properties, then I would have the concern. But there's no way I can see in the foreseeable future that Overbrook, even though it's named Overbrook, is going to go over the brook. It's going to stop there. Okay. Um, that the second thing is uh, the other issues are uh, building in a hazardous area in the floodplain, and I defer to Ben on that. And then the building coverage and impervious coverage are all based on build of a lot area, and the build of a lot area is zero. So you can't really calculate what the impervious or the building coverage is. If this lot were a were not in a floodplain, then it would conform. So it clearly is a hardship as far as the fact the entire lot is within the floodplain. Uh, maximum number of stories isn't required. Uh, there's a <coughs> variance for accessory structure setback set back for the uh, air conditioning condensers are set back eight feet from the north property line. And basically the reason for that is to set them on the side of the house. They've moved the house to the north as far away from Poplar Brook as possible. And those condensers are right next to the trash area for, a con for a commercial use immediately adjacent to the lot. So I don't see any substantial negative impact. Okay. And Mr. Malik, before you begin, Claire, if we can please mark the packet. As B1. You do every time. So <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Mr. Matlock. Uh, first, I agree with Jim <coughs> regarding the, the frontage. Uh, I don't think that there's an issue. Uh, I, I think that he's, he's right that the Overbrook Avenue acts as an extension of a driveway, uh, and the, the applicant is proposing to essentially e extend the uh, Overbrook Avenue by, by bringing his driveway on, onto the end of the street. Uh, which which I don't have a problem with. Um, yeah. the, uh, the so the ordinance requires that, that sidewalk should sidewalk should be provided on both sides of the street as well. Um, there is sidewalk on Overbrook uh, Avenue, uh, but not on, on 
this subject property and not on the adjacent property, uh, which is a, a business and a parking lot. Um, so I don't think it's absolutely necessary to uh, require a sidewalk in front of this, this uh, house. Um, the proposed development does result in an increase in impervious surface. Uh, it's, it should be noted that the development does exceed the maximum allowable impervious surface required by the ordinance because uh, it, the buildable lot area is zero, so it is allowed zero impervious. Um, but it also does not meet the definition of a major development in accordance with the Stormwater Control Ordinance <coughs> and the NJDEP standards. Um, I do think that uh, some stormwater mitigation measures would be appropriate here uh, because uh, of the development within the flood, air, flood hazard area. Uh, it's, it is generating new runoff uh, and, and uh, it's, it would be a, a mitigation effort um, by the applicant. Um, the pool equipment uh, is required to be elevated along with all mechanical equipment in the flood hazard area, such as the air conditioner, uh, um, utilities in the, the, uh, the structure. Uh, and that should be shown on the plans. And then a, uh, a detail should be provided for the flood vents, um, including calculations demonstrating compliance with uh, FEMA requirements. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And um, Ms. Krimko, as far as the stormwater mitigation issues, the pool equipment raised. We can comply with everything in the flood left. vents. Okay. I apologize for choking on the record a few <laughs> moments ago. I, I breathed in my water. Okay. I, I, and Madam Chair, we don't, other than moving our plans into evidence, we don't have a lot more to add than what your planner and your engineer said. Your, your planner testified it's a hardship. Your planner testified we'd be compliant but for being in the flood hazard. We do have DEP approval already. We do have Freehold Soil Conservation District approval already. So this is really a technical variance in the context of we're developing in an area where the town doesn't want development unless we can prove that it's safe to do. And I think that by virtue of the DEP approval as well as the comments by Bill and Jim, we've established that it is safe to do here. So just quickly, A1 is the survey prepared by Nelson Engineering dated 11-4-21. A2 is the... Uh, plot and grading plan and it also happens to be the flood hazard area verification and LOI application plan by Nelson Engineering revised through 41023 and A3 are the architectural plans prepared by Zimbler Architecture and uh, they are dated everyone puts their dates in a different area 42122 so I do have the engineer here, and I do have the architect here, and they are available for any questions that the board may have, but we're stipulating to everything in Ben's letter. Uh, and obviously we would ask not to construct the sidewalks short of that. I don't have anything else to present to you. Okay, questions from the board? Yeah. Well, I mean, we don't have any plans, but is the home gonna be Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, raised I didn't know that you didn't have plans. Yes, it is required, so, it is required to be raised. If you look at the arc, I'm sorry, if you look at the plot plan, the crawl space is, and the garage is at elevation 22.5 and the finished first floor is at elevation 30.33. So the first floor of the house will actually be approximately eight feet, approximately eight feet above. And that's because it's in a flood zone and basically the, the, the crawl space will act as the flood right. area. Um, the vents. Correct, because we agreed to that. So to just kind of clarify that for the board, um, the elevation of the, the ground on the property is roughly around 21, 22 feet. The flood hazard elevation is 29 feet. So when, it, during a, a design flood storm, the 100 year flood event, uh, floodwaters are going to be at elevation 29. The requirement is that the building needs to be built at least, the first floor needs to be built at least one foot above that. So there, the first floor elevation uh, is at 30.33. So it does be, meet the uh, flood hazard uh, requirements. It, they have a uh, flood hazard area permit from the state. Uh, it complies with the flood damage pre prevention ordinance. Um, and the uh, 
flood vents, um, which are in the, the foundation, uh, allow flood waters to pass through the, the building foundation so it doesn't damage the structure um, when, during, in the event of a, a flood. I don't know. Thank you. No concerns about the pool then being dug under, because obviously the pool's dug into the ground, no concerns really? That's, uh, from, a, from a zoning standpoint, it, it's not, a, not an issue. Um, you, you can get a permit from the, the DEP for constructing a pool in the flood zone, uh, and which they have, uh, and it, it really doesn't um, impact anything from the, the board standpoint. It will get dirty. <laughs> after a heavy no it will after a heavy rain it may be entirely underwater so when <clears throat> the flood waters recede it's going to be a little hard be a little dirtier than most okay. I was actually going to ask I don't I see a permit to build a a home um I don't am I missing the pool part of it let me swear in uh I'm sorry I just yeah the, I yes the the application made to the DEP did include the pool as well and I, 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 I if this paper doesn't say it, correct because the plan that's able to get one. So right the, just, just the, the plan that. that's referenced includes it but I also think that a pool is permittable as a per, under permit by rule correct you just have to meet certain requirements yes so if we weren't building the house we were just doing the pool I think it could be done under a permit by rule anyway any other questions which well, basically is an exemption yes <laughs> Okay. Questions from the public? Okay, motion to close the public hearing. Make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. Clear. Yes. <coughs> yes. 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 Okay. Uh, is there an offer for the variances? I'll offer a positive resolution. A second. Who seconded that? I'm sorry. Look at look at uh, Claire on top. Of everything <laughs> telling me who seconded it. Yes. 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 Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next is Albert Palacci, 430 Roseld Avenue, Ocean, Block 58, Lot 3, Zone R2. Applicant seeks approval to keep an existing technical three-story dwelling and non-conforming driveway that were constructed in violation of the original zoning approvals. Variance needed for maximum number of stories, maximum driveway width, and minimum driveway setback. Okay, I'll be away for like two weeks. Okay, Mr. Palacci, if you can raise your right hand, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth? I affirm. Okay, and I will ask Mr. Higgins and Mr. Matlack for their report. Okay, this is another application of when it was filed that required a variance for number of stories and the subsequent ordinance that was adopted by council has now eliminated the need for the variance for number of stories. They need a variance for driveway width, which is basically a technical variance because of the way the driveway is configured and the way the uh, is calculated. The width diagonally at one point of the driveway is 22, between 22 and 23 feet, uh, so that a variance would be necessary there. Uh, and the rest of the driveway complies. The other issue is that the driveway setback is required to be five feet. And I know the zoning officer had issued a zoning permit uh, with, with conditioned upon the driveway being set back five feet. And it was constructed where it's set back two feet. And when you look at the plans, the actual the garage that the driveway accesses is on the property line. and. If the driveway is set back five feet, it actually extends beyond where you, you, you trip the door to the garage. So the two foot setback, I think, makes sense, but I think we need some testimony to that effect. Okay, and again, if we can mark it, B1. Mr. Matlack. Uh, yes, the only uh, comment I had was that the, uh, the as built survey indicates a proposed recharge system near the basketball court and the east side of the house. 
Uh, the applicant should indicate if these systems have been installed or will be installed, and then design calculations should be submitted. Uh, I actually had a conversation <coughs> with Mr. Palachi uh, earlier this week, uh, and he, he discussed that uh, uh, the systems were installed and they were reviewed and approved by the township engineer. Um, is that correct? Correct. That's correct. I actually have pictures that you don't have. I found some of these big recharge... Uh, Okay, we'll uh, mark those, and if you can... Do you want to, me to submit this? Just that would be A1. I guess that would be pictures of material used yeah, for, for recharge the system. recharge system, and we also put a, at the edge of the basketball court a trench drain mm -hmm. that can actually connects into the recharge system. We had Tom Abakey in from the township engineer come and inspect every step, step of the way. So if you can just tell us about your request and address um, Mr. Higgins and Mr. Matlax. So uh, I'm just, uh, just exactly what Mr. Higgins said. It wouldn't make, uh, the way that the lot is structured, it's like a flag lot where there's a, uh, there's a, uh, there was an existing garage set back. Um, if I, if I constructed the side, uh, if I made the setback, five feet from the, it was existing two feet. All I did was really replace, uh, in this picture over here, you'll see that this was what was existing. I just re took out and replaced that, the board that was uh, rotting. If I put it okay, let's, into let's the- mark that as A2. A2. We have that one in there. We have that in our packet. It's, it's in there, there yeah. Okay. Um, if I made the uh, the driveway uh, further, it would go into the into the garage, and it wouldn't allow me access to one of the garages. It wouldn't line up. It wouldn't line up, and I it wouldn't be able to function as a garage. Um, as far as the two feet of the width, it I. Uh, if you notice in this in this picture, the two feet that we're talking about is between the pavers and uh, and this uh, wall over here, and the reason being is that we wouldn't be able to make the turn. I have uh, teenage drivers; it would be very tight to make that turn, and it's literally only in this area. I was under the impression, I put the walkway there on purpose because I was under the impression that the two feet calculation would be from the edge, uh, from the edge of the walkway and the way that it's being calculated is from the edge of the um, uh, retaining wall over here. So if you don't mind, we don't have that one. If you we can mark as A2. Which is that should be there. But Did I address all the points? Okay, and Mr. Matt, I, I believe he addressed yours earlier with you. Yeah, it, I, I don't have any concerns. The, the recharge system was installed. It was, if it was reviewed and approved by the township engineer, then, then I don't have any concerns with it. Okay. Questions from the board? So, um, you had an existing driveway back to that garage, right? Correct. And you redid it? No, it was just, it was taken out and repaved. It, yeah. Everything repaved. stayed the same. Yeah, yeah. So you, you was it repaved in the exact same location that existed? It did, yes. Okay. Yeah. I thought we fixed right. that. What? I, 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 thought that, I thought that stuff wasn't coming to us anymore for the past couple of years. I don't know how this got here. Yeah. I think it was because the driveway was expanded. Uh, and the, the wraparound portion in the front. In the front yeah. area. John yeah. wanted just a one for one. It was expansion of the what was there. Okay, gotcha. But it was it was already that close to the property line, I guess, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Questions from the public? Okay. Um, motion to close public hearing. I'll make a motion to close public hearing. I'll second. Yes. 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 
Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Okay, and uh, someone offer for the variance for the maximum driveway width and minimum driveway setback. I'll offer a positive resolution. I'll second. And real quick, we're, so we're voting on that two foot wraparound then? As well as the expansion to the edge of the patio? Uh, uh, garage? Yeah. For both of those, right? Right. Well, the existing garage was within two feet of the property line. Two feet. Okay. And then he expanded it the other way to make the curve. In the front of the house. Okay. Not okay. For the garage. Right. piece. That piece right there, yes. Yeah, okay. so it's both. Yes. 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 Okay. Good luck. Thank you, guys. Last case is Deborah Pereira, 30 Blair Court, Ocean, Block 38, Lot 45, Zone R2. Applicant seeks approval to remove an existing gazebo over deck with bridge and construct a 20 foot by 25 foot um, covered rear deck with outdoor kitchen. The existing gazebo over deck is pre-existing non-conforming in that it does not meet the required rear yard setback. Applicant proposed to construct new structure in same location. Variance for rear yard setback is required. And Ms. Pereira, if you can raise your right hand, and do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth? Yes. Okay. And, sir, will you be giving testimony as well? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, may I have your name? Francis Mark. That Ada. Francis Martin. Mark. 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 Pereira. Okay. And if you can raise your right hand, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth? Yes. Okay. And we'll okay. mark the and we're marking the packet before Mr. Higgins be one. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's dated August 9th. The applicant proposes to remove an existing gazebo and hot tub and replace it with a covered patio that will include an outdoor kitchen with a sink, grill, and brick stove on one island, and the second island will be a beverage refrigerator. The structure will be a 22 by 25 foot, 550 square foot and will be 15 feet high to the peak of the roof. The lowest part of the roof will be 10 feet. So basically the clearance underneath is 10 feet. The site is a, a significantly irregularly shaped 29,540 square foot parcel and a bunch of re residential uses on all sides with the exception of an unimproved right of way, which is called Truax Lane, that abuts the western property line. The, en the end of that right of way abuts the, the western property line. Consequently, the site technically has two front yards. Given the unusual shape of the lot, the functional rear yard is a function, it has a function similar to the side yard. The entirety of this rear yard abuts an approximate 2.5 acre residential parcel that is the subject of a current application for a house of worship. And that's the one that may go to this board and may go to the planning board, and that's, that's still in flux. Variances, accessory building setback. The ordinance states that accessory buildings over 150 square feet must maintain the required setbacks of the principal building. A 40 foot rear yard setback is required and 11 feet is proposed. The proposed building replaces an existing gazebo that is partially enclosed. It is in the same approximate location, not enclosed and somewhat larger. <coughs> its height is consistent with the ordinance permitted 50, maximum of 15 feet. The intent of the ordinance is to provide for adequate light, air, and open space. In this instance, given the unusual shape of the lot and the fact that this part of the lot is not dissimilar to a side yard, which requires a 10-foot setback, I have no significant concerns. Okay, Mr. Matlock. Uh, my only comment was that the applicant should uh, discuss whether any grading mod modifications are proposed. And I apologize I didn't put this in my report, uh, but uh, because the size of the, the construction it's it's 550 square feet which is over the uh, 200 square foot threshold which requires a grading plan uh, to be submitted I don't have a problem with a grading plan being submitted as a condition of any approval the board wants to grant and I apologize the applicants uh, if I didn't ask for it the construction department would ask for it when you went for your building permits so uh, it's it's something that that needs to be uh, submitted um, either way, either here or, or there. Okay, uh, Ms. Pereira, if you can tell us about your application and um, address the 
compliance with the grading plan being submitted. So explain why we want it there. Yes. Basically. Um, so we want to remove the existing gazebo that has a hot tub and there's a little bridge that connects to the hot tub. We don't use it. The hot tub's broken. The reason we want to put the kitchen there because we have plumbing and electrical already. So, and it's right off our sunroom where we have pool table. So it just makes sense for us. Um, it just makes sense for us and why we want it there. Yeah. Okay. Um, questions from the board? So the gazebo is kind of set up high. No, it's not high, but it's, it's off the ground. Yes. Yeah, it's up there. It's got like the thing on top and then the weathering up there. Mm -hmm. So the kitchen is going to be on the ground? On the ground, on the ground, yes. So it will ultimately be all lower. Yes. Is that right? Okay. Any other questions? No questions from the public, I see. Um, so if there's a, uh, oh, the, the grading plan, if that is a condition, you do not have any issues with no. providing that. We'll okay. provide that yeah. They're going to have to do that no matter what. Right? Yeah. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Um, motion to close the public hearing. I'll make the motion. Oh. Close the public hearing. Second. Yes. 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 Okay. And uh, I'll make a motion for positive, positive resolution. resolution. Best of luck. Thank you. And a motion to, for to adjourn. adjourn. Second. <laughs> All in favor? <laughs> Aye. My energy level just went down, down.